my lords, I was going to take you one final time to the decision in, in Fleming. Uh, that's authorities bundle one at tab two. Uh, to just go through and make it clear exactly what the what, what the issue was uh, concerned uh, that their lordships, uh, Lord Lord Hope. Uh, at, um, at nine and eleven, uh, make makes clear that the, the concern is is dealing with um, the effect of the new legislation on uh, on late claims, which the uh, uh, would have been entitled uh, to bring, uh, but which which were now subjected to this new time limit. Uh, at nine, uh, he cites Mark for Spencer and the. And the general proposition uh, and uh, puts in the caveat this will not be in breach of EU law so long as tr transitional arrangements are included which will allow an adequate period for the lodging of claims which persons were entitled to submit under the original legislation and then at 11 uh, to be compatible with EU law uh, taxpayers were entitled to be told in advance of any transitional arrangements that would enable them to submit late accrued claims uh, for the deduction of, of input tax, despite the introduction of the time limit, and that that's what they were entitled to be uh, given notice of, and the sort of customs business briefs, etc., weren't weren't good enough for that, uh, and so that was the flaw. And I do not think that the gap in the legislation uh, can be uh, made good on a case by case uh, basis. Uh, so um, that was the, the gap in the legislation which couldn't be cured by the court uh, and uh, um, consequently he agrees with uh, Lord Newberger that it's a, a matter for uh, for Parliament uh, and the court was presented uh, with uh, various alternative periods of disapplication which were to be read into the legislation that would uh, introduce this, this <coughs> time limit, uh, but each of which applied equally uh, to claimants who had, uh, had their rights retroactively taken away uh, and to those who hadn't and none of those periods would be Appropriate, so they were rejected. But at paragraph 10, uh, he makes it clear that uh, he would not rule out the possibility in a suitable case of the court reaching its own decision as to what would be a reasonable time for the making of claims uh, and rejecting claims that were made after a period which was held to be reasonable. Uh, but that wasn't the, the issue in, uh, in Fleming. Uh, so then to Lord Newberger, he adopts very much the same approach. His, his concern uh, is with... Um, that this the effect of this judge-made uh, legislation. Uh, we've seen he cited the, the paragraph 79, he cites the case law. Uh, paragraph 83, uh, he confirms uh, in the general uh, approach that the, that the court uh, should take uh, in the light of the, the, these considerations follows from the retrospective effect of Regulation 291A and the absence of any transitional provisions that the duty of the United Kingdom courts <coughs> is to supply uh, the regulation uh, in relation to claims based on accrued rights made during an appropriate period. So the wider duty of the court is to disapply. But um, what was being put to the court um, in this case was the, uh, the <coughs> this idea that there should be a transitional period which the legislature ought to have uh, accorded um, which is the one that would uh, has has the the, the, the time limit uh, so on 85 he says that on on uh, given that regulation 291a came into force on 1st of may uh, 1997 people with accrued rights to claim input taxes at that date would have had to put their claims by 1st of may 1998 uh, so one reaches this position. The vice in the regulation uh, is that it contains uh, no transitional period uh, to enable persons with accrued rights to make their claims, and the remedy on the commissioner's case that there is to be a period of disapplication whose existence would be unknown uh, to any reasonably well-advised person with an accrued right until it had already expired. Uh, so it's precisely that reading in the transitional period with the time limit uh, attached to it that expires and no one knows what it was there that was um, uh, did not cure in any sense the vice in the in the legislation <coughs> and exactly the same point 
uh, is made in relation to the uh, principle of legal certainty at, at 88. Paragraph 88 is, as I've mentioned, a, a valid limitation period must, in order to satisfy community law, be fixed in advance. In my <coughs> judgment, the same principle must, as a matter of logic, apply to a transitional period, which has to be included when a new retrospective time limit introduced. After all, the transitional period serves the same function as a limitation period. Uh, if that is right, as I see it, the period of disapplication envisaged in the last sentence of paragraph 41 of Grundig must also comply with the principle. And so he's talking here about sort of the true transitional period. It serves precisely the same purpose as a limitation period, namely to enable uh, people with a certain type of claim uh, to know within what period they have to bring their claims. Otherwise, where, where no transitional period has been provided for, persons with accrued claims will not know or be able to find out with any confidence uh, by when they have to make their claims. Uh, so, um, if you, if if a period of disapplication uh, is applied uh, to a person whose rights are going to be taken away uh, by the period, uh, that is inconsistent with the principle of of, of legal certainty. Uh, and so, he looks at, at Grundig at, at eighty nine uh, and says, well, you, you can't use um, the paragraph forty one of, of Grundig to create that kind of uh, limitation period. Uh, and the same point, he's, throughout, he's, he's concerned with the position of taxpayers whose rights have been made uh, virtually impossible or excessively difficult, i.e. those who've had their rights either taken away in a puff of smoke or taken away uh, in circumstances uh, where it's not possible to, uh, excessively difficult to bring the claim. Uh, he, he looked at Fantasque, and Marks and Spencer, and, and 95, uh, and he explained what, what's the practical consequences of the, uh, of, of the um, period he's being asked to read in, 95. In my opinion, if the period of disapplication in the present case expired in May 1998, it would have been virtually impossible or excessively difficult uh, for persons with accrued rights as a class to mount their claims in time, uh, in the light of the wording of Regulation 291A, uh, both common sense and expert legal advice uh, would have led to the conclusion that would have been a waste of time. So um, the, the persons um, who, who, if you'd had this transitional period um, uh, read in, um, because, because it expired in May 1998, that meant that the persons with accrued rights, uh, whose rights would otherwise be uh, <coughs> curtailed by the extended limitation period, uh, which expires in 1998, would still, uh, as a class, be out of time. So um, he, he, he again is saying that um, this, uh, th this, is the, this is the problem uh, with this, this type of transitional period, which um, we're being asked to, to read in. And it was in light of that that uh, he agrees, in principle, with uh, Lord Walker, uh, whose um, decision on um, disapplication we touched on uh, briefly yesterday, uh, I think, at, at paragraph 102. Uh, but as we've seen, that his conclusion was that um, if, that's, if, if that's the problem, then uh, it is, a, um, it, it is a, a problem that needs to be solved by, by Parliament. Uh, the judges uh, cannot introduce that kind of transitional period, which has the effect of introducing a, a, a time limit which nobody knew was there. So the, the appropriate period of disapplication uh, to deal with that, um, that issue, uh, is one that uh, lasts until Parliament uh, deals with the matter. But again, he says that uh, 108, uh, that he's prepared to accept that in an appropriate case, a decision of the UK court uh, could have the effect of a period of, of disapplication. Um, Lord, Lord Walker, uh, who actually dissented on the Condé Nast, but um, you see Lord Newberger, Lord Carswell um, agreed with, with, with Lord Walker. 
so in a, in a sense there is a slight sort of shifting um, majorities but um, uh, he deals with disapplication at paragraph 62 um, where he, he, he expressly uh, states that the definition of an adequate transitional period um, it, well the question is whether the definition of an adequate transitional period is properly a matter for the national court um, not for the legislature uh, my lords in my opinion that task is not merely within your lordship's power but is in your lordship's plain duty under EU law uh, the disapplication of offending legislation is the duty of the national court uh, even if it involves action which would otherwise be alien to the strong judicial instinct not to intrude on the province of, of the legislature uh, and over the page uh, he says that um, at 66 he says that Grundig too shows that the disapplication for an adequate transitional period is the appropriate response uh, and he applies that to, uh, to, to, to Fleming uh, says that well, Fleming, Fleming's case on, on, on any view uh, was um, would, would not um, uh, would have to be sort of allowed <coughs> because um, it it couldn't benefit from any any such uh, period. But all the, all their lordships are are, are in an agreement that the job of the national court is to disapply the legislation for an appropriate period. The issue is wh what what is the appropriate period, and it, in the context of um, a, a disapplication a transitional provision that introduces a new time limit, um, that is not something for, uh, for, for the judges, held the majority. So, um, all the, the, his, his reasoning was also concerned uh, with what, what, what it is, is, what's the scope of disapplication uh, that the national court uh, can, uh, can achieve. Uh, and he, he um, in in the in the present case, so Lord Walker takes a, a, a broader approach. He says, "Well, it's just the, the duty of the national court, but what what guides the uh, the, the, the national uh, court in in other cases? Well, the principles that we've already are, are articulated that the period of disapplication um, must be such uh, as to ensure that taxpayers with accrued rights uh, are entitled to." Uh, to the, the benefit of it, um, but it doesn't follow from um, uh, EU law, the requirements of, of EU law, that taxpayers uh, who, whose rights have not been infringed because the, the, <coughs> the, the new legislation has not uh, uh, put them in an Im impossibly uh, difficult position, uh, <coughs> benefit from those rights. That's the, um, uh, that is sanctioned by EU law paragraph 41 of Grundig and it is the, uh, in, in accordance with the general um, uh, principles of disapplication as articulated by uh, Lord Walker in ICI and Colmer in section 2.1 of, of the European Communities Act. Uh, and um, the, the, the <coughs> Chancellor in, in, in class 8 he cites uh, uh, Fleming uh, he cites uh, uh, Lord Justice Lewison in the Leeds case that uh, 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 in contrast uh, to Fleming considers the position of uh, what, what is a, 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 a prospect, an adequate prospective period uh, and concludes in the, in the class 8 case that uh, what is being uh, put before him here uh, in, in class 8 was um, a period of disapplication, uh, and uh, he did not regard himself as as banned by Fleming, and he was correct uh, not to do so. He was concerned with a uh, with a different issue. So those were my submissions on uh, section three twenty, and I think that well, I think the only point of principle uh, that was that was raised uh, by, by my learned friend was concentrating on the sort of the rump end of the of the Condé Nast. Uh, mm. thing. To say, well, look here, we did. Here are some uh, uh, claimants within Condé Nast uh, who, who um, uh, 
Coat claims were in time, but they were dealt with in the same way. Uh, and there are sort of two answers to that. First, um, uh, the, the sort of claimants, the class of claimants in the Condé Nast uh, uh, case, Condé Nast had brought a claim, some of which was, was in time. There was that same uh, problem uh, faced in that the, uh, the, the, the period of disapplication, the transitional period that the revenue uh, was seeking to raise, uh, was being um, erected to apply against everybody. Uh, it didn't matter what their position was. Uh, so um, that, whatever it was, that, that's not a thing that judges could do. So that was uh, rejected. Um, but if there is a, a category of, of, of persons who um, whose claims would be made excessively difficult, then uh, under that type of reading in a, a limitation period, they will be um, uh, they will be adversely affected, but under a, a, an ordinary disapplication approach where you're disapplying the, the legislation to the extent that it um, offends um, uh, individual EU rights, then they are protected. Uh, so that, that was section 320. But they weren't protected. That's, that's the point Mr. Kuczynski, I think, makes. On the facts, <coughs> they won. And so, <coughs> insofar as the ratio of a case is the legal rule will, which explains what the outcome is of a case on its own facts, uh, how do you distinguish the tail enders in Condé Nast from the present case? Because the, all, it's only the, the legal reasoning in the case was all concerned uh, with those, uh, the, 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 the vice in the legislation. Uh, bringing in this time limit, uh, which um, did not uh, protect those people whose rights were taken away or made more difficult, and then the only uh, so that, that that's what the reasoning goes to, and the only um, alternatives put before the court as how to deal with that vice was the revenues submission that you read in this alternative, this, this transitional provision, which creates the limit, the time limit, which applies to everybody. Uh, there, was, there was nothing else put. No, it, it, was, it wasn't suggested that the revenue weren't sort of dealing, um, uh, that their lordships weren't dealing with, with an argument uh, remotely like the period of disapplication we're concerned with in this case, because this case does not involve revenues disapplication, does not involve a judge-made uh, time limit. Yes, I understand. And are you going to make any submissions in reply on Duke and Reliance Systems? Um, I was um, uh, skipped it by, but uh, what, what, what I would say about uh, Duke, Duke and Reliance is that um, uh, where you have um, a, a, a decision uh, of, of the court um, where uh, you know, the, the issue of the court, the issue that the court has to decide is the same as the issue that the court has to decide in another case. So um, uh, it, a question of statutory interpretation, um, does section X mean A or does section X mean B? And then um, an argument is made, and the court decides that this section means X. Then it is not open uh, to somebody else to come along um, in, a, in a subsequent case. And no, this this section means B because I thought of another, a better way of, of putting the point. But that that is dealing with the same issue of principle. Whereas in the present case, uh, we would say that because the um, the, the the process of um, by which um, we are asking the court to approach this matter is of such a fundamentally different nature uh, to the process which the court was being asked to uh, deal with in, uh, in uh, the Fleming case. Uh, it, it, it's a different point. There are there are other cases where you know, different. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tax um, scheme case where um, taxpayers um, took a case and lost in a. 
in the House of Lords on the basis of, 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 of one uh, set of uh, set of arguments uh, on um, sort of Plummer, and then in a subsequent case, Moody, the revenue raised a Ramsey argument, and that mm -hmm. so the issues were all different, and um, a different reason was was reached, a different outcome was reached. So one has to identify closely what's what's the issue, mm -hmm. and sometimes the arguments will inform what that issue was. And I, and I suppose you would say that the Elias case can be explained in that way, that the, the issues were radically different in the two cases. Yes, and because the issues are different, the principle will be different. Can I turn to section 32.1c? And first, on the, on the points of uh, permission, um, um, we say that um, the, the, the claimant just also accepts that the revenue is entitled to take the point on discovery, uh, but really takes their point on discoverability. But we say that we get home on discovery. Uh, and that's that's enough to decide uh, the case. And Jastel's point is that it, we need all this more evidence uh, that would have been necessary for the case uh, to be uh, fairly decided. And so the only fair outcome would be a, a remitter, and, and that would be well, a, rem a remitter's not sought. Um, however, we would say that the um, all that rests on Jastel's sort of reading of what it means uh, for a proposition of law to be discoverable. And their case is that neither the, the link later's advice nor uh, the claim uh, made the law discoverable uh, to others because the rest of the advice in the, in the city might, might have been that uh, that wasn't a tenable. Uh, position, uh, but we say that the link later's advice, together with the claim, means that the mistake was discoverable. So I'll go on to uh, to, to develop that when we're uh, when we're looking at the, at the, the test in, in substance, um, and Jastel also sort of said that well what. What what, um, what more could we have done to preserve the position on, on, on appeal? That we should have treated it as a uh, as we did with change of position. But they are they are different types of, of defence. Change change of position is a ge generic defence. Uh, the revenue um, uh, it disentitles the, the the revenue in certain cases. So on balance, it's it's clear what evidence would have been. So we went through the exercise of putting forward that, that evidence, but um, uh, essentially before the Supreme Court's decision in, in FII, uh, it's difficult to have predicted what, um, uh, what what evidence would have been needed. So um, our primary submission is that mistakes of, of, of law uh, were discoverable, which makes, and so no evidence would have been required. Um, but if, um, if and to the extent one looks at evidence, then our submission is that the uh, mistake was discoverable on, uh, uh, under the law as it now stands, when a statement of claim could be pleaded much at the latest. Um, but um, uh, that, that in, in the present case, it's answered by the fact that we, we have a claim. Uh, and when one's looking at sort of fairness, which we fully accept the court will, will want to take into account all the factors in the case uh, to consider the, the, the fairness of, of the revenue uh, raising this uh, this point. But we do found our submissions you know, pretty squarely on the fact that in this case, in 2000, Jastel was advised uh, by its solicitors uh, that it had an arguable 
uh, case and uh, on the basis of the advice it, it, it did receive it instructed Linklaters to maintain to put forward a claim to the revenue which articulated precisely uh, the mistake that was made uh, and just on the on the nature of that claim uh, it was a put in as a protective claim to preserve their position uh, and it had that effect what, what what happened was that the claim was uh, was put in it satisfied uh, the uh, the requirements of the regulations which as my learned friend said there really aren't any uh, specific requirements you've just got to make a uh, make a claim and then the time passed HSBC um, occurred in the um, Court of Justice that dealt with the uh, issues of the clearance uh, service the FTT uh, decision uh, that followed that um, uh, a, a year later or, or so dealt with the position of the issue of the shares to the depository receipts uh, and that was held to be at Clare so follow, shortly following the uh, decision in, in the FTT um, uh, Jazztel knew that both limbs were covered and what it did was wrote to the revenue saying uh, we made a claim under regulation 14 back in 2000 will you pay? And the revenue did I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that but it, it, in many cases it, it, it is of course un, unfair to make taxpayers uh, go through the, um, the mill again and have evidence that this, in this case they asserted <coughs> in 2000 <coughs> that they'd made a mistake uh, and uh, the, the, the purpose of that was to protect their position which it did the test is could could they, with reasonable dil diligence, have uh, discovered, or, or um, did they? And that's what we say they did uh, discover. Um, once you understand what the what the proper threshold is. So, section thirty two one c. Uh, just to put it in its context, that um, the the rule is, you get six years uh, from the date when the cause of action occurred. That's the general rule, uh, section 5. There is an exception uh, if the claimant can prove, first, a mistake, um, secondly, that the, which was an essential element of the cause of action, and thirdly, which could not, with reasonable diligence, uh, have been discovered. And if, if you meet those tests, then the claimant is entitled to postpone the inception of the, of the limitation period until the date on which the mistake could could have been discovered or was discovered and that um, shows that uh, section 321c is an exception to a general rule uh, in the ordinary way one approaches that uh, with a a narrow reading, we say that approach is implicit uh, in the majority's judgment in FII in the Supreme Court. It's explicit in the minority's analysis at uh, 2982. Uh, and we say that also shows that my learned friend was wrong to suggest that, that there were some troubling policy concerns if one adopts the the, the revenues uh, construction because it would force claimants into issuing protective claims uh, to stop time running even though they didn't believe that uh, they had a worthwhile claim but um, that simply can't be right because when the claimant discovers 
at their mistake, that simply starts the normal limitation period. So the claimant has from them six years in which to investigate their claim, take further advice, consult lawyers, plead a claim. And only after that do they need to actually issue a claim. Uh, so six years uh, is time for ample research into the point. So the idea that there's a policy concern of saying, well, yes, you have six years from the, the date of your mistake, because you know, otherwise, as uh, soon as it crosses your mind, you have to issue a protective claim, uh, is not uh, well uh, founded. So the claimant doesn't have to issue a protective writ on discovery of the mistake. They've got six years from that <coughs> time uh, to do the investigation. Uh, if they investigate, uh, and they, for whatever reason, don't decide, um, perhaps because of the advice that they're given, perhaps because they don't want to um, uh, incur the, the costs, perhaps because they want to wait for someone else, for whatever reason, um, their limitation ban is barred after six years. So, what what's what's the the, the test? Uh, to be uh, applied, and uh, yeah, Maloney Plan puts a lot of emphasis on the on the statement of claim, sort of broad test. You've got to you've got to have a reasonable belief. You've got to believe in the in, in the assertion that, uh, that that you're putting. Um, uh, so, what was what was suggested that he sort of tied that um, line of fraud cases with the worthwhile uh, claim uh, test. Um, and so that's where he focuses on sort of statements of truth, reasonable belief. You've got to be in a position where you can you believe that your statement of, of claim, the thing that you've articulated, is right on balance. Um, and, and we say that, um, that there, are, there are two tests for, 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 for knowledge. Uh, which we read discovery in, in the in the cases, um, there is the, a statement of claim test uh, uh, derived from the fraud cases, which says that the the claimant has discovered a fraud uh, for the purposes of section uh, thirty two one when the claimant is in a position to plead a statement of claim alleging the relevant facts. That's cited at um, in FII at paragraph one eight six. That's you might call it the fraud test. It applies to section 32.1b. Uh, so on that analysis, wh whether a pleader can put their name into the document and a litigant sign the, st the statement of truth is centrally important. So that's no doubt why my learned friend uh, relies on it. Um, however, that's one test. Uh, the formulations in Fulford and Brooks, Howard and Fawcett, and AB. Uh, ask whether the claimant uh, knows with sufficient confidence to justify embarking on the preliminaries uh, to the issue of a writ, um, a preliminaries test. And the points about that, it, 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 it is nothing to do with fraud. Uh, <coughs> uh, the, the case, that case comes from the, the, sort of the personal injury uh, line, but we have seen that, that the ge generic issue which that line uh, raises, which is concerned with, with knowledge under sections 11 or 12 of the Limitation uh, Act, um, are, uh, are the, that is the, the branch of the law of the Howard and Fawcett's uh, line, which the Supreme Court has adopted. And what is absolutely clear, that that is earlier than the fraud test. Uh, limitation can start on this test before a claimant is able to plead a, a, a statement of claim. And that preliminaries test is endorsed by the Supreme Court in, in FII, um, and it expressly reserved its position on the on fraud cases. Uh, it's 
from FII um, 191. So it is the preliminaries test that applies to Section 32.1b, and, and there is a stark difference between us on that and on the on um, Jastel's case. The, the, the inquiries that um, are going to be needed um, uh, to establish by evidence uh, of all these preliminary trials uh, every time uh, th th this issue is raised is going to be uh, a matter of difficulty. But we say it is, in fact, a much more uh, simpler matter because one is starting from the proposition that uh, mistakes of the law are generally discoverable <laughs> because one can get advice on them and look them up and it's really only in the exceptional case, such as FII, where um, the law just isn't there <laughs> until a, a series of court decisions uh, shape it. Um, that's different from a, a directive, which says uh, what, what the law is. And there's, there's nothing unfamiliar is about... Is really any different? I mean, I quite follow with the ignorance-type case. Hmm. It's all straightforward. Um, but when you're outside the ignorance type case, does it really make a difference whether there's doubt as to whether a directive applies or doubt as to whether the Supreme Court might overrule a court of appeal decision or whatever? I mean, in every case, you're trying to anticipate what will be held in the future. Yes, I, I, I'd, I'd accept that. I think that the category... Um, the the Supreme Court saw the FII category as a unique category, uh, just for, for, for what it was, that there had been a, a, a long-established uh, um, view of the law um, that the national law stood um, uh, to, to, to be applied, and a, a gradual creeping of the treaty the application of the, the treaty to the national law. So that is a category quite different to directives in terms of what taxpayers knew about directives, what individuals knew about directives. The um, <coughs> VAT uh, uh, taxpayers have been struggling with the sixth directive. It, like it, took, it took 10 uh, 1970s cases uh, look a bit um, uh, suspect um, at the, the VAT tribunal level, but uh, directives have just been part of, understood to be part of the law um, and to be relied on. So it's not that sort of exceptional category. Um, can, so one's asking, well, can, uh, <coughs> is, is that type of mistake discoverable or do we all need to go and get expert advice? And no, we don't, that's not the sort of unique category uh, of case like FII where there's expert advice needed. I've got to have I've got to say mm. this. Um, so so VAT was always different in the sense it was very fully transposed into domestic law. Mm. And until M&S, indeed, everyone thought if it had been properly transposed, you could only look at the domestic law. So it was really, in that sense, rather like any other tax dispute. It might be a lot of small print you have to wade through, but at least yes. you know in principle yes. what to try and do. Yeah, at quite an early stage, you, you, sort of, you, you realise you had to work out your... Your, what your national law meant by, yeah. by, by relying on the, on the directive and yes. those inconsistencies. Well, I'm uh, not trying, to, to, not trying to belittle those difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, it, it, but it, 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 it was part of the, long established to be part of the framework of, of, of the law. Um, so uh, back to the preliminaries uh, test. Um, well, what well, what, what, what does that really um, uh, in, entail? Uh, and how does it relate to, to a worth, the worthwhile claim? <laughs> um, my friend says, well, it's all about the worthwhile claim. That means you've got to know, you've got to have a claim that you believe in. Um, uh, but what is clear is that uh, Lord Brown's worthwhile uh, claim uh, is explicitly equated with the, the preliminaries test. Uh, in FII, uh, it, it, the, the the fraud test of putting it at the front of the uh, of the um, uh, of uh, of the line of saying, well, it's 
can you put it in your statement that this is not adopted? Uh, so it, it, it doesn't mean that. But um, the learning firm wanted to say that the, you know, the worthwhile training test is really the, the baseline. I mean, as I understand it, you sort of reverse your position. So you have the two formulations. Mr. Grudzinski says, well, actually, um, uh, the first test must be understood in the light of the second one. It's the second one that's key. And do you say yes. it the other way around? Yes. But um, well, they, 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 they feed off, they feed off each, each other. But um, once, once you accept that uh, the preliminaries test is a departure from the, uh, from the fraud test, um, you must be accepting that, um, the, the, that Mr. Godzinski's characterization uh, of, of the test uh, is wrong. I mean, a worthwhile claim uh, is not one uh, which can be pleaded in a, in a, in a claim form. Um, so what they're really saying is that Lord Brown's test is the fraud test. And it's clear from the Supreme Court that they, they haven't uh, adopted that. Uh, it's meant to be the same as the preliminaries uh, test. And so for more importantly, that, that distinction, we say, shows that, that JASTEL must be out of time. Um, if the fraud test uh, was satisfied on the facts found by the judge, JASTEL must be out of time. Um, that's because the preliminaries test is, on any view, less stringent than the fraud test. So if JASTEL could have, could, have pleaded a statement of claim alleging their mistaken payment on any particular date, they must be out of time under the preliminaries test. So to be clear, if Jessel could have pleaded a statement of claim <coughs> alleging their mistaken payment on any particular date, uh, then we say they must, at that time, have reached the stage of limitation running under the preliminaries test. Can we just pause there a moment? Um, I mean, this, this would be a very simple case to plead. Um, uh, I made a payment. Uh, the law, in fact, is that I didn't need to make the payment. Uh, therefore, I made it under mistake. Um, uh, and you could do that even if you had the merest suspicion. If you, if you looked at Linklater's letter, but left with no more, but were left with no more than a marginal doubt, not a serious one. You can perfectly well plead the case. It'd be very easy. Um, so yeah. Is that good enough? Uh, yes. And if you've done so, if you have, <coughs> if, if you've received advice that says, here is a, here is a potential cause of action in the stake for these grounds, and you then instruct your <coughs> solicitors to make a claim on the basis of that advice. You have reached the stage. You, you have discovered the fact of the mistake to the required threshold. Could you make a claim? Yes, you, you, you have made the claim. So just hey. sorry, the um, we were looking earlier on at, um, for example, A B. I know you get it all over the place, uh, where yeah. um, a distinction is drawn between a degree of confidence and a mere suspicion. So you say even a mere suspicion, um, at least an informed suspicion. suspicion Starts time running. What if if you 
mere suspicion, if you don't do anything about it, uh, is not enough. But if, if you suspect sufficiently to issue a writ, you may think, well, um, I'm a vexatious litigant, might, might not be um, worth it. In fact, the case is probably hopeless, but you know, I'm going to put it, put it in. Privately, I think my claim is not good, but I issue a writ. Then you have, you can't then say that um, uh, your writ, your mistake, is not discoverable. That, that's the ratio. That, that is the ratio, maybe, but we haven't got a writ here. No, <laughs> uh, there not being a writ. Why does the fact that Jazz Tell instructed Linklater to write the letter take one any further? Well, because the, o the only difference between um, Jazdell's claim under uh, the Stamp Duty Reserve Tax regulations and the <coughs> issue of a writ is the statement of truth. But that, that can't be a an essential feature of saying whether you've discovered your your mistake or not. If one accepts that in, in the High Court's uh, case, you know enough to be able to assert uh, your claim, and you, that that means you just cannot say that <coughs> you you weren't you weren't aware of it sufficiently to stop limitation running. Then, in substance, the the submission of a of a claim to the tax authority asserting exactly the same uh, mistake uh, with the same legal consequences in the sense of your time stopping running, running against you under that regime. Is there perhaps a further point here that um, in the normal way of things, I mean, if there is statutory machinery for bringing a claim, you have to use that machinery and you may well be uh, as did, in fact, expressly or implicitly, if you try to start ordinary legal proceedings. So in the present case, um, Linklater's the only option really open, available to them at the time was to make use of the statutory machinery by means of a claim for which no specific machinery was laid down. And it's only later on when they wanted to get compound interest, which they couldn't have got under the statutory machinery, that they actually brought the proceedings they did in whenever it was 2013. Yeah, that, 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 that is correct. The, 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 this was, in substance, the, uh, the, the appropriate mm. mechanism under the law by which they um, had to ass could assert their claim, and, and they did assert their claim. Can, can I just understand that a bit more? I mean, it's the first stage to asserting the claim. It, it turns out to be good enough in the end to get the money back. Um, but HSBC obviously took it a stage further. That they had paid, they put in their claim, and then they pursued it to the first year tribunal. Well, plainly Linklaters didn't pursue it to the first year tribunal. So how would they have pursued it to the first year tribunal? How, how would uh, uh, how would Jastel? We've we've seen uh, yeah. the letter of claim, yeah. but plainly Jastel, if it had wanted to, could have followed that up in the same way that HSBC did. So what would it have done? It would have been some kind of appeal. Appeal to get to, yes, appeal to the, uh, to the tribunal. Yes. Uh, HSBC is sort of running along um, at the same time. HSB pay their yeah. SDRT. Much so they don't sum. need any kind of assessment. They, they, there was a, uh, no. a mechanism to appeal. So well, that's what they did not do. There must be a time. It's a determination under regulation. It's a determination. So you appeal to the special commissioners that Do we perhaps would it be useful for us to have a copy of the SDRT regulations? We um, can certainly the, provide them in the bundle, just, yes. just um, so we can check out these points if we want yeah, to. It, it, it's yeah. it's reg regulation fourteen. Yep. And six. And, and six. So what does six say? There must be the notice of. Where shall I read it out? Where it appears to the board. That's the board of email. A relevant transaction has taken place or where a claim is made to the board in connection with the relevant transaction and 
what board may give notice to any person who appears to them in relation to that transaction to be accountable to be to be the accountable person or the person liable for any of the tax, stating that they have determined the matters specified in the notice. Um, I'm just trying to find where the appeal, subject to any variation, let me just find where is the appeal provision. How do you get as far as a determination? I mean, mm. so far, Jastel has put in a claim. <coughs> you, you, you request a determination, do you? A person on whom a notice under Reg 6 has been served may within 30 days appeal against any determination. That's Regulation 8. Yes, I think so. So, the, so, so Jastel would have had to ask for a determination. Notice of determination. And then it would have appealed appeal. the determination. So we never got to the stage of a determination in this case? No, nor an appeal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so but we, we say that the, that the fact of, if, if one is looking at the, um, the statement of, uh, of, of case, um, uh, what, what test the statement of claim, what, what, what is the test to be applied, um, if that were the correct test, and we say it's even before that, uh, it's clear that Jastel could have pleaded a, a statement of, of claim on the date of the, of the link late of advice, um, because Jastel wrote to the revenue alleging that mistake and seeking restitution of, of the funds. So Jastel can't say that the, the facts alleged in the letter were, were false, or the legal claim was one which could not have been put uh, in a statement of claim. So Jastel's claim with the revenue shows that they could have pleaded a statement of claim alleging their mistake. So therefore, on the test, of the Supreme Court, they must have discovered uh, their mistake. And Mr. Baldry, is this a submission under the subjective limb of the test or the objective limb? Uh, it, it is a, uh, a submission on the, on the subjective uh, limb. We say that it follows from that, that the objective mm. limb yes. must be satisfied. But yeah. it, is a, it is a submission on the subject. Yeah. It was Jastel that received the advice. It was Jastel that instructed um, yes. uh, Linklaters to make the claim, and it was Jastel that made the claim. Yes. Uh, you, 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 you may or may not be right about that, but what do you say in response to Mr. Grzynski's submission that so far as the subjective limb is concerned, that you're stuck with the findings of fact by the trial judge, and there's been no Edwards and Bairstow type appeal against those findings? Now, we say that it simply doesn't matter what Jastel, uh subjective view of the merits of, of the claim were. Uh, and we say that if ja the, the, the concept of a, a mistake for the purpose of establishing cause of action it is not the same uh, as the concept of discoverability, or discovery of a, a mistake. Um, you know, this was really uh, my learned friend's main, main point, that um, the finding of fact that Jastel uh, was mistaken precludes a finding that it has discovered its mistake. I mean, I'm not sure that necessarily captures the essence of it because he says, well, look, not really did the judge find that there was a mistake, but he found that Jastel had no more than a marginal doubt. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not one of those cases, whether or not they exist, uh, where you think it's 51% likely yeah. that the money was due. Jastel, on the judge's findings, had no more than a marginal doubt. Well, look, in, in, in my submission, Jastel's private sort of state of mind uh, is not relevant 
uh, to the issue of discoverability. The question is, did Jazdell discover its mistake because it had got to the stage of being able to articulate that mistake in a claim, in a formal claim, then Jazdell did discover the mistake. I mean, so, it, it, just pausing there. Um, now, I follow how you get that on the um, being in a position to take steps or whatever it is. I've forgotten the precise formulation test. Uh, can't see how you get that out of worthwhile claims. I mean, if, if you're in a position where uh, it has been explained to you that there is something, but you form the view that uh, you are definitely liable and have no more than a marginal doubt about it, you don't think there's a worthwhile claim, do you? Uh, no, but have, have you got to the stage of um, being able to take advice as to whether you have a worthwhile claim? And if you have got to the stage of articulating a claim, then your view, personal views about the, the merits of, of that claim, uh, whether it's a surefire winner, 50-50, or pretty flaky, are irrelevant. You've, you've got to the stage for limitation purposes. Well, that's the A, B, as Lord, Lord Wilson says, paragraph three, that once you've, once you've asserted your mistake in a, in a claim, you can't then be said for limitation purposes to say that you didn't know about it. For limitation purposes. It's almost a kind of logical point, isn't it? And the whole point about limitation is you can't begin an action, or you have to bring an action if you're going to do so at all within a limited period. But if you do then begin an action, you can't be heard to say that you, mm. <laughs> the yeah. period has expired. And, that, 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 and it's, it's almost a sort of estoppel. It's, mm. the, it's, the, it's the logical paradox mm. yeah. that, that, the, that the Supreme Court uh, had to look at in, in Hirsch. And Hirsch was, say, was yeah. saying, um, we haven't discovered our, uh, our, our mistake, even though they'd issued a claim. This, this can't be right. Mm. Do you mean Hearst or do you mean uh, in, in, in FII? In FII, oh, FII. yes. In yes. FII, um, oh, I see, yes. one, of, one of the main reasons for departing from DMG was this sort of yes, paradox yes, that yes. produced. But, but, it, but AB is that sort of case. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah, yeah in a, a, AB, they, uh, they, they got to the, uh, to the stage where you know, the evidence still was your claim will lose, but it doesn't matter. So once one accepts that the discovery doesn't entail truth or, or certainty, then you can discover a mistake you haven't made. Can we just look at the formulation? I mean, for example, in paragraph 291 of FII. Repeating the formula we find elsewhere, um, made a mistake with sufficient confidence to justify embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ, or uh, recognising that a worthwhile claim arises. So let's take the state of mind found by the judge, which is uh, no more than a marginal doubt about uh, whether the tax is due. Suppose you have no more than a marginal doubt as to whether you're entitled to get your money back. Can you really say to be said to recognise that a worthwhile claim arises? Uh, yes, well, I, I would say so. Once, once you, and what does worthwhile claim mean? Does it mean, uh, in the ordinary sense, well, I've got a, I've got a good claim, or is it in more in this more nuanced expression, uh, have I got a, a claim 
uh, of the kind that can be articulated uh, as a matter of law. Uh, and do you, it's not a question, do, do, I, do I believe my, my claim is going to win, in that sense, a worthwhile claim, uh, but uh, do I, have I got to the stage uh, that of recognizing that a worthwhile claim, in the sense they're talking about here, uh, arises? Now, you stressed the earlier, Lynn, sufficient confidence to justify embarking on a preliminary to the issue of a writ. Um, well, that implies some degree of confidence. Um, and of course, embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ is uh, not merely writing a letter, it's moving towards the issue of court proceedings. But can, you, can you say that if you have no more than a marginal doubt as to something, you would have confidence enough to justify embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ? Um, well, that 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 will always depend on uh, what 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 in every, every single context that's going to depend on what that context is. But your your doubt about the the legal merits of of the claim uh, and whether whether you think that. Um, uh, the merits of the claim are not good doesn't doesn't stop you having confidence to justify finding out about whether you do have a claim. Well, that's not what it actually says. Confidence to justify embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ. Um, there certainly there's, there's there's a there is an area of speculation where you just somebody has a a hunch that something might be wrong, that's not enough. So yes, it's, it's more than that. But in the present case, we have, we have, we have way surpassed that test because um, we have submitted the claim. Jastel has submitted the claim. The, it was in a different form, a forum, uh, but what, what can't be said if you submit a claim is that I didn't discover the mistake on which that claim was based, for limitation purposes. So the fact that it's it's a common it's common ground that, that Jastel has recovered tax on the basis of the claim that was put to the revenue means that it, it's not simply a, a a request, but it's akin to the issue of a writ. If if they hadn't forgive me, Mr. Baldry, for interrupting, I, I just want to get my mind around what that was all about. So, so the, the repayment occurs many years later because the revenue by then appreciate the true legal position. Uh, if, if, the, if the letter, or the, sorry, let me call it claim because that's the word you used, if the claim dated the 11th of January 2000 had never been made, then would the revenue have had any power to make the repayment? Could, in other words, could they have done it voluntarily? Um, not, not to my knowledge. I, mean, I, mean, um, I, I, I can't think of any power by which the revenue would have um, such a. I mean, there, there would have to be some basis, just as a, as yeah, a, a because that, of public. Because as we, as we all know, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, because I, I may be barking up a wrong tree here. But the revenue is a tax collecting authority. And they have to collect tax in accordance with law. Mm. Right, that's, that's subject to some exceptions, and I know about concessions and so on, but yeah. nevertheless, generally speaking, that's their duty. And so what, 
see, I've, I've been struggling in my own mind to work out what is the legal characterization to be given to that claim made by Linklater's on the 11th of January 2000. Uh, Mr. Grzydzki characterized it as a request. And occasionally he used words like, please, give us our money back. Yeah, I understand. And he may be right. Yeah. We'll, have to we'll have to consider those submissions. But I've been wondering in my own mind whether the true characterization of it is that although it's not in a formal document such as a writ or claim form, as we now call it, in a court, but nevertheless that it is a formal statement to the state that I am entitled to this money back. In other words, that you have a legal obligation to pay me. Not that it would be a good thing. Um, no, no, that, 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 that is exactly right. Um, uh, and thinking it, thinking it through, it, it is Regulation 14, yeah. which permits the claim to be made, uh, imposes the obligation on the revenue what, what, to pay the claim. Right, because the revenue might think, actually, blow me down, you're right. Yes. We accept your assertion, mm -hmm. and therefore we are going to pay, therefore we have the legal authority to make this payment. So if anyone else comes along and says, I, I don't know, if the if the if um, if there are a committee in Parliament that looks at what the revenue is doing, if if somebody checks what would we be doing, have we been giving away money when we didn't have an obligation to do mm. so? No, we gave it back because we had an obligation to give it back because yeah. we accepted the validity of the claim. Now that way you wouldn't ever need to get the formal determination or any appeal to the FTT. Have I understood all of that correctly? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, regulation for, will provide uh, copies of the, thank, thank of, of the uh, regulation. But, I mean, uh, an, an appeal only comes into the picture if the revenues say no. Exactly. And then, then the taxpayer wants to take it further. Then you have to get an appealable determination. Yeah. So for the purposes of finding a statutory basis for the repayment, I mean, that was subject yeah. to what you were just about to read us. Yeah, re 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 regulation <laughs> 14 says that if... If on a claim yeah. mm. uh, it is proved to the board's satisfaction that too much tax has been paid in respect of any relevant transaction, uh, the excess shall be repaid by the board. Uh, mm. I think your junior wants to. <laughs> uh, and. Um, at the, at the relevant time, uh, Re Regulation 14 also provided that a claim under this regulation shall be made within a period of six years, beginning with the later of uh, the date on which the payment was made or some accountable date. So, uh, more, than, <laughs> more than a writ, <laughs> this claim. Uh, gives you uh, a right of, of repayment, um, provided that you can satisfy the board that too much tax has been paid. And so the board there will look at the claim, uh, and they have to be shown. But once they are satisfied, they, they are duty-bound uh, to repay. So what happened after the FTT decision um, was that a further letter uh, was submitted in, in 2014, uh, which referred to the claim made under Regulation 14 back in 2000. And just to be clear, the relevant claim was not made in 2014. No. That, that was, that was absolutely, that was for time living. That would be out of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so they needed, in a formal legal sense, the peg that they needed in order to get the repayment which they did obtain in 2014, that letter of the 11th of January 2000. Right, thank you. That's very helpful. So, that, those submissions so far have really been concentrating on 
what jazz tells, the application of the, the, the test to jazz tells subjective mind. And did jazz tell discover? And once you've got to the stage of issuing such a formal claim, articulating precisely the mistake, then for limitation purposes, you can't be said to say that you haven't discovered your claim. Uh, turning to the objective uh, limb, um, we say that you've got to, again, ignore the findings of fact about Jazz Tell's uh, state of mind, but that's because uh, the question isn't what Jazz Tell subjectively believed, but what shows, uh, but what could, with reasonable diligence, uh, have been discovered. So how does the point a, a arise? It, the objective limb uh, is only in play if there is um, there's no evidence or no sufficient evidence of discovery. If there is a discovery, uh, the objective limb doesn't arise. But the essential evidence of, on the objective limb uh, would normally be other parties' beliefs uh, and actions. The, uh, the claimant's beliefs are I irrelevant. Uh, so the court should, when considering objectively, ob the objective limb, consider both the advice and the claim in conjunction with and separately uh, to assess their significance. So on discoverability, we, we say first that the submission of the claim constitutes uh, discovery. Subjectively. Yes. Uh, we say that's crystal clear from now from FII AD. Um, but if we if we lose on that, um, we'll lose on that because of findings about Jazdell's sort of subjective state of mind. Um, but put those to one side. But if if so, um, if, even if, on the facts found by the, the judge, the submission of the, of the claim did not cons constitute a discovery for, for Jazdell, the question then is what, what submission a, a third party would make about the claim. So we say, first, objectively construed, Jazdell's claim was a claim. Um, on the authority of FII and, and AB, so the submission of a claim constitutes discovery. Uh, and this to discover entails discoverability. Um, and it follows that if uh, uh, one multinational company uh, has discovered the proposition of law, so can articulate the unlawfulness that would give rise to a, a mistake, then logically that proposition of law must be uh, discoverable. So Jazdell's submission of the claim shows that the objective limb uh, was satisfied. And so we again say that this submission, <coughs> in this case, stands irrespective of, of finding of fact, and the only question is, is some reason to think that further evidence might have arisen such there is some kind of procedural uh, unfairness, um, and we say, well, that's impossible for that to be the case here, because um, the submission of a claim constitutes discovery. It's not an inference on the facts, it's, it's a conclusion of law. There is something a bit odd about all this. There are two possibilities in the legislation. Either you discover something, or you could have discovered that same thing. Um, here, looking at documentary evidence, because there was no oral evidence, the judge has concluded what the actual recipient of the letter uh, and uh, the other materials <coughs> Uh, concluded. Uh, 
um, Jazz Tell had no more than a marginal doubt. Wouldn't it be rather odd if um, one arrived at the conclusion that a different recipient would have arrived at different conclusions when the exercise that the judge was going through was just deciding what those documents would have conveyed to the reasonable recipient? Well, um, but what, what I would say that that shows is, is, is how ir irrelevant Jazz Tell's subjective belief was. Once looking at the um, a claim that's uh, been articulated uh, and uh, and made, uh, there, there there may be. Uh, Ten hypothetical people that think it's a brilliant claim, ten that think it's 50 50, uh, and ten that think it's a hopeless claim. That, that but we don't have any information as to what Jastel in fact thought beyond what we see in the documents. No, um, the documents led the judge to believe that Jastel had no more than a marginal yeah, doubt. And, and but why should one assume that anyone else would have arrived at a different conclusion? Uh, because, because uh, I don't think I, I, I do. I say it's irrelevant. <laughs> What, what, the, what they thought, what is, is relevant, is that Jastel was able to articulate its claim. It, 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 I'm trying to work out what this adds to the subjective element. If, if you're right that the, the fact that Jastel was able to articulate its claim is enough, then yes. you win anyway. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 but it, it's really there uh, to deal with. If, if we win, then that's true. But um, another taxpayer uh, um, may not have had advice uh, from Linklater so clearly and may not have issued um, a claim to the, to, to, to the revenue and the question is for them was the, mis was the same mistake they made discoverable so we have HSBC Norton Rose um, advising them, uh, paying the tax, going through this, uh, the process, took time, uh, 2007 the, the, the reference, Jastel getting advice. You know. If Jastel uh, could and did get the advice that produced the claim, that is evidence of objective discoverability in Jastel's case, but not necessary but also for everybody else. Can, can I just try separating things out for a moment? Leave aside the claim just for a moment. So suppose you were only faced with Linklater's letter and accompanying note which Jastel received and on the basis of which the judge thought that they were. Jastel thought that um, it was liable for the tax, albeit it had a marginal doubt. Um, why should it be supposed that any other recipient of the letter would have arrived at any different conclusion or do you not suggest that any other recipient of the letter would have arrived at a different conclusion uh, I, I, I submit that the, the fact of Janstel sending its claim can, can I leave yes, that on one yeah, side yeah, okay. the moment? Um, so, just take the letter the, yeah. letter, the judge concludes having looked at the letter that Jastel still thought that it was liable and had no more than a marginal doubt. Now, do you suggest that the letter would have uh, um, led a hypothetical, reasonable recipient to a different conclusion? Um, well, I, 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 I would, but um, the letter, which um, was the basis on which Jastel instructed uh, the issue of, of the claim uh, was uh, one stage earlier uh, <coughs> a time at which the um, the objective recipient could have discovered the mistake why, why should um, it be assumed that the, that person uh, who's being told they've got a uh, an arguable claim uh, wouldn't submit the claim Yeah, so it, yeah, it, um, um, Mr. Wilmot Smith um, says to me that, that it, it is, I think your lordship is, is positing what, what why, why do 
we assume what these other people would have done. The testes, what could they have done? Is that right here? Um, the, the, I follow that in the um, where you don't know anything, <laughs> you look at what you could have found out rather than what you should have found out. Um, but here, the argument is about what Jastel or the hypothetical reasonable person would have concluded from a letter they actually received. Is that the same? It, it, it always comes back to the test of well, what, what could the reasonably diligent person have, mm. have done? And that surely involves an inquiry as to what in practice your notional person with resources and a reasonable degree of enthusiasm and so forth would have done by way of seeking advice and that's where the expert evidence comes in because you know, one can't a priori give an answer to that kind of question. But but I, but I, but I would, I would say that in, in the ordinary, take take the ordinary case of you know, not not um, complicated tax, but just mm. uh, someone makes a, a a mistake of law, that the Supreme Court's starting position was ordinarily, it's discoverable because you could discover it. They're, they're not envisaged. I know um, on my learned friend's test, the uh, chaos will ensue, but the Supreme Court were envisaging. <laughs> A, a, a simple uh, test with a with a very very low threshold. That yep. Ordinarily, if you make a mistake in law, you, you objectively you could because you you can ask a lawyer to explain your rights uh, to you. It, it's really the, the FII proceed, proceedings um, were the the unique case that gave rise to the possibility of. Of expert evidence, because in in that case, um, in the in the exceptional case where you've just got no law on the matter uh, for a period of time, uh, and a whole settled regime of law in the unique circumstances mm. of, of FII, in, in that case you will need expert evidence. But that is a totally exceptional case. The ordinary case, you make a mistake of law. The only question is, could you have discovered it? And the ordinary result is, is yes. And so we would say, well, we are an ordinary case. But there is there is no need for, for expert evidence on our, and if our view of the test is is, is right, that, that follows. But you know, the defense says, no, it's much more complicated. You've got to investigate for everybody. Yes. Mm. And we all know hindsight is wonderful. But I mean, ultimately, I suppose the real issue is whether one could one could have found one's way to a, an advisor who would have said, well, the only real issue here is the applicability of Article 12 of the directive for this kind of case, the season ticket defense. Um, and if that doesn't run, you're, you're plainly um, not plainly going to be OK. Um, I've got the wrong way around. I think in the ordinary sense that the Supreme Court were thinking about, well, you know, Mistakes of law are ordinarily discoverable uh, because there, you, the, the, the position is simply you could discover it. You know, you might you might go to the wrong the wrong lawyer and get, get the wrong advice, and you, but that doesn't prevent it. No, discoverable. And you plainly couldn't discover it in the sense of it being completely obvious that, that, that that's the only possible answer. I mean, that's completely unrealistic. All, you, all you've got to discover is you've got a, enough of a case to be worth pursuing. Enough of the case to be able to articulate, to articulate what, what it, it is to put the point to the revenue in, yeah. a, in a way which doesn't it's not self evidently um, untenable, but shows that you have at least a point which might ultimately ground a reference to the ECJ. And, and your uh, and if, it's, it's, if you it's then answered in your favour, that, that would ground recovery. Yeah. yeah, I think it may be, Mr. Baldry, with, with due respect to you, it may be going too far to suggest that this is an ordinary case. But I'm not sure you need to yeah. make that submission. What, what, as I understand, because if it were an ordinary case, then of course the time limit would have run from the time of payment, each and every payment. Mm -hmm. But 
what you're really saying, I think, is that the critical piece of evidence is not, a, not advice, not people seeking advice, not people investigating. It's that a, a claim was made, mm. asserting that you have a legal obligation to pay this money back to us. And that was done on instructions from the lay client. And let me say again for the record, in case anyone should have any doubt about it, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there are no aspersions to be cast on Linklaters or on anyone else. Uh, but they wrote the letter which they did, in the terms which they did, on instructions from their client. And you say, either that proves subjective discovery, or if for some reason it doesn't, it shows what somebody could, with reasonable diligence, have discovered. Now, you may or may not be right about that, but I think that's, yeah. that's the essence that, of the That is the essence yeah. of it. Yeah. Now, now, on that second limb, the objective limb, I think the fundamental objection which has been taken against you is that we shouldn't allow you to run this at all uh, by way of amending the grounds of appeal because it, it, this was never articulated as an issue in the lower court. That's not a criticism, that's just a fact. The trial ran the course it did. And so applying well-established principles summarized in Singh and Das, um, we would not normally, as an appellate court, allow you to take a, a new factual point, uh, because that might have shaped the way in which the trial would have been run. Not necessarily certainly would have been, but this is where I think the fairness point comes in. That, that one always has to bear in mind that fairness is not just about getting the outcome right. It's about getting there in a fair way. And one doesn't want somebody to go away from court feeling that they have been treated unfairly, that there was something that they might have liked to say, evidence they might have liked to adduce, even if it wouldn't have persuaded the judge at the end of the day. But they didn't have that opportunity. I think, I think that's mm. the germ of, of the fundamental objection being taken. So it's too late for you now. Well, my look, you, 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 have, you have my submissions on what we say that the, the threshold is and why um, on the uh, subjective test we do meet it. And because of that, on the mm. objective test, we must meet it if your lordships were to arrive at a, a, a different threshold, which means either of those but were not correct, and your lordships thought that further evidence uh, may, be, may be necessary, then uh, the position would be, would be different. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, those, those were the revenue submissions in reply. Um, in this case, um, uh, thank you both very much. Thank you. Uh, those also uh, alongside and behind very much. Um, you've certainly given us a great deal to think about, uh, so you will not be surprised to know that we will not be delivering <laughs> any judgments here and now. Uh, we uh, will reserve our judgments, and uh, I would expect that they would be uh, handed down uh, remotely. Uh, even if there were a hand down in court, as I know you well know, uh, there'd be no question of anybody needing to attend. Uh, in the normal way, you will be provided with uh, drafts uh, in advance of the hand down for you to correct our English, but not to re-argue the case. Um, uh, we would be grateful, please, if you would attempt to agree uh, an order dealing with consequentials in advance of the hand down. If there are points on which you disagree, we'd be grateful for brief uh, written submissions, and we would expect to settle the points in the order that we make. Uh, but thank you all very much. Court rise.